Hello, I'm Lori McPhee. I manage programs here at UC Berkeley's Arts Research Center, and I want to welcome you on behalf of ARC's director, Julia Bryan Wilson, to tonight's extraordinary reading with two of our most important, influential, and respected poets, Terence Hayes and Simone White. After reading, they will be in conversation with our own Chayuma Elliott, uh, an assistant professor in the Department of African American Studies and one of ARC's Poetry in the Census board members. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that UC Berkeley occupies the un unceded territory of the Ohlone peoples and to pay respectful tribute to this land as their ancestral home. This event is part of ARC's Poetry in the Census Initiative, a two-year program made possible by engaging the Census Foundation. And I'd like to give a huge shout out thanks to the foundation and Mona Abadir for their support. I'd also like to thank our wonderful co-sponsors for this reading, the Departments of English, the Black Collaboratory, and the Center for Race and Gender, as well as my colleagues, Julia Bryan Wilson, Lauren Pearson, and Lindsay Panner. Uh, during the spring of 2021, ARC has been celebrating poetry by exploring the theme of emergency voices to carry with us in times of crisis. Last month, we heard from Safia El Hilo, Human Wen, uh, Craig Santos Perez, and their event link is still available on our website if you want to go back and listen. Uh, and tonight, we'll hear from Terrence Hayes and Simone White. In April, we're beginning a new flash reading series online featuring over 20 poets from the Bay Area reading a poem that responds to this theme of emergency. Some of the stellar poets uh, that will include Juliana Spar, Damani Thomas, Will Brewer, Kim Shuck, Sam Sachs, Jeffrey G. O'Brien, Jennifer Chang, Ari Banyas, and Sophia Dolan. So please check back with us in April for that. Now for tonight's event, uh, though they barely need any introduction, I'll give short bios for both poets now. They'll each read for 20 minutes and afterwards, Chai will come back for a short conversation. Afterwards, there'll be some time for questions and answers. So please feel free to ask at any time in the chat off to the side, and we'll try to carry some of your voices uh, into this space. Um, so our first reader will be Terrence Hayes. Terence is the author of six poetry collections. His work has garnered an incredible number of honors from a National Book Award for Poetry, the Kate Tufts Discovery Award, National Poetry Series Award winner, uh, along with the MacArthur Genius Award, uh, fellowships from the National Endowments for the Arts and the Guggenheim Foundation. I could go on. His poems have appeared widely in journals and magazines, including The New Yorker, Poetry, American Poetry Review, uh, and the Harvard Review. He's a professor of English at New York University. Second reading will be Simone White. Simone is the author of Or or On Being Another, the, excuse me, Or On Being the Other Woman, forthcoming from Duke University Press, Dear Angel of Death, of Being Dispersed, and House Envy of All the World, and the chapbooks Unrest and Dolly. Her poetry and prose have been featured again widely in Art Forum, Harper's Magazine, Bomb Magazine, Chicago Review, and the New York Times Book Review. And her honors include a Creative Capital Award, a Whiting Award in Poetry, and Kavi Khanum Foundation Fellowship. She's the Stephen M. Gorn Family Assistant Professor of English at the University of Pennsylvania, and she is joining us in, from Brooklyn. Um, so first up, I am so thrilled to invite Terrence Hayes next onto the screen. Welcome, Terrence. Hey, everybody. Thanks. I'm really excited to be here and really hear what Simone's been up to. This will be a good conversation. So I, I, y'all sent me some questions in advance, and I really try to just put together um, something that's sort of in the order of what I started doing and, you know, about a year ago. So this is all mostly new stuff. This will be the oldest thing and an overlap from, you know, I just thought I should, I, I still occasionally will write in American science. So this is uh, one of the ones that aren't in the book. It's the only one I'll read tonight. So all I'm really trying to do is read from like stuff that started, you know, last March or so into, you know, the most recent stuff. And then I try to do it based on those questions. So I'll probably refer back to it later. Otherwise, I'm just gonna read. Uh, I'm gonna get my time here and I'm gonna see how much I can get through. I, I think I'll probably just jump around. I, I won't read everything that you'll see pass on the screen. American Sonnet for Inner Visions. When James Baldwin and Audre Lorde each lend Stevie Wonder an eyeball, he immediately contends with gravity, falling either to his knees or flat on his luminous face. 
I've heard various versions of the story. In this one, Audre Lord dons immaculate French loafers, turtleneck ball gown, and Afro halo. An eye-sized ruby glimmers on a pinky ring that's a hair too big for Jimmy Baldwin's pinky. He's blue with beauty. They're accustomed to being followed, but now the eye patch twins will be especially scary to white people. Looking upon them, Stevie Wonder's head purples with plural visions of blackness, gavels, grapples, purrs, pins. Odds are 10 to one, God also prefers to be referred to as they and them. I had this whole little thing going, and this is just a little part of it. I did three of these kind of like do it yourself sonnets. I mean, uh, do it yourself sestinas for something uh, at the Phillips collection in April. So I pretty much spent, you know, uh, 75% of that, that first month locked up just working on this really elaborate thing that I haven't really read since then. I read it when I did it and then I just moved on. So I thought I would pull it out and see. This is just the first part of it. Uh, the drawings are like from the two, the three sections. So this one's like Envoy of the Nude. I mean, we could talk about it later. I can't explain it all, but uh, I'll just read a little bit of it. Uh, what does the piece remind you of? The Negro in an African Setting by Aaron Douglas, 1954. Take the hazy overlook toward the Negroes and the stars. Stay on the overlook toward the mouth of the river. Past the Negroes parked in the dark, hiding in the field. Take River Six Boulevard to the pyramid. Go through the tunnel. Pass through an agitated rainforest and get on a ramp to the bridge. After several hours on the bridge, take the exit to the sea. Take the unlit shape of one of the blacks you see in the scene and make it a Henri Matisse collage of six yellow stars. Stencil the unlit figure on all the crosswork signs for drivers. Hello to the Negroes parked in the dark hiding in the field. Follow the Matisse hiding in Frank Willis Thomas with tunnel vision. After the last crosswalk sign, take the next bridge. Do not enter the river. Relax on a quilt on the bank with your bride. Leave the door of your gray house open for all to see. Take eight hour siestas, whether the sky fills with lightning or stars. Follow the eyes of your bride watching trouble rise in the river. Take time admiring how good your guitar makes you feel, passing a hand over its strings as your bride hums its tune. Head along the river until you come to the long railroad tunnel through the mountain. Take the second left after the bridge. Follow the signs through the towns no one built to withstand the siege of poverty or weather. Employ tunnel vision amid the stairs. Should you pause for rest, do not enter the river. Hello to the Negroes resting on the train, riding over the field. Head downhill to the valley, avoiding where flood waters fill the lanes. Every hole in the ground is an unfinished tunnel. Take a shovel for burying seeds and bodies beneath the bridge. Take just the front half of your face and say what you see when you lower it into a basin of river lit by lighting and stars. Follow signs of the creatures who live at the edge of the river. Stay on the overlook toward the mouth of the river, past the Negroes parked in the dark, hiding in the field. You can almost see face down in haystacks if you use the tunnel vision. Hello to the Negroes crossing a bridge. Take the shape of one of the Negroes you see. Take the overlook, whether the sky fills with lightning or stars. I won't read the second part, it's very elaborate, so we can talk about it later. That's just, you know, the pictures are there for you to kind of look at. Um, let me see how we're doing so far. Okay, so then, uh, you know, and uh, I was sort of just locked up working, trying to distract myself. You can almost see nothing of like pandemic in those, in those pieces. Um, and then, you know, uh, the end of May came and, you know, George Floyd and the protests were just right outside my, my door. Literally, I could hear him sitting right here. I could hear him walking by uh, to go to the park. So I, uh, I wrote this, like, after laboring over these things all month, you know, this one came out pretty much in the morning. Like, I heard him that night. Uh, I went out with them. And the next morning, I woke up and wrote this thing. And then I actually sent it that afternoon uh, to the New Yorker. So it, it did run. But before all that happened, this was just all part of that weekend. I made this video and I sort of was just, you know, it was my way of thinking about what was going on. So, so I'll show you that now.
dyes his hair a striking Dennis Rodman blue in the face of the man kneeling and blue in the face the music of his wrist watch your mouth is little more than a door being knocked out of the ring of fire around the afternoon came evening's bell of the ball and chain around the neck of the unarmed brother ground down to gunpowder dirt can be inhaled like a puff the magic bullet point of transformation both kills and fires the life of the party like it's 1999 bottles of beer on the Wall Street. People who sleep in the streets do not sleep without counting yourself. Lucky rabbit's foot of the mountain lion do not sleep without making your bed of the riverboat gambling. There will be no stormy weather on the water. Bored to death, any means of killing time is on your side of the bed of the truck transporting Emmett till the break of day. Emmett till the river runs dry your face, the music of the spheres. Emmett till the end of time. Uh, and then there, I'll just read a couple of these little smaller. As you can see, a lot of the stuff I've been doing has been uh, visual. So I, I think I'll just read like one of these, maybe one or two, and then you can look at this uh, last other video. I think we'll see how much time is left. Uh, Russell Atkins. The practice of a poem should be what archaeology makes you feel glowing red in a dark room. Art should encourage expenditures of beasts buried with candelabras burning elaborately underground. Rhythm need not table panic, it's warm. Type prototype versus stereotype in a letter to Marianne Moore on her deathbed and await her reply. Every word was air when the zeitgeist was no more Mr. Nice Guy. If you get to Moscow on a song, you will be soaked in a rain of applause unless there is snow. There must be stretches of your own colorful moonlight operatic combustions breaking gently from the speakers of post-industrial Cleveland. Do not allow surprise agony to quiet. Rhythm need not table panic. Art, you realize, does not explain taxonomy, Antarctica, lavender. Ghost rest in the nest. A blood of lighter fluid makes you perspire. The fear inside the lonely cloud consumed by the lake. Vainly restrict sinking, garbling, or gulping garbage worth incalculable miscalculations. One transparent word rushed toward the unyielding ear. Is a window a shimmering shard of rain hung from a blue wall? Is a poem the practice of anything struck out and lifted with fingertips? Russell Atkins waits Marianne's reply. I don't feel like, I feel like we just got, how much more time do we have? I think I got like, a, I think I could just run this other last video. I'll just show you some of the other stuff that was here. And as I said, uh, in our Q&A, um, this is the most recent thing. Um, here, I'll, I'll read this and then we'll, I'll show you this last video. Woolworth, across the street from the men in bars of booze, music, and confinement, a dog walked into a diner to find diners eating, a cat eating, a mouse eating, a daddy long leg spider, and an empty stool at the lunch counter beside a quartet of black boys eating nothing. 
The dog leapt nimbly from floor to stool, a pair of paw cushions barely touching the seat cushion as it jumped from stool to the counter and turns its snarl directly upon the cat who paused in its meal of the mouse, who paused as well in its meal of one of those daddy long leg spiders folks say are extremely poisonous, but whose fangs are too short to break anybody's skin. Not the shorter leg daddy long leg arachnid that shares its name with the spider and secretes a small poison when attacked. A man walks into a bar and sets an ugly bone. I, I, you know, I have been trying to do this in a cat voice. I just can't do it for y'all today, but imagine this is a cat talking. A man walks into a bar and sets a big, ugly bone down on the bar. The cat says to the snarling dog without clarifying whether it might be the bone of a dog or the bone of an animal mauled by the dog. The man sets the bone down beside a wad of cash and orders a tall tumbler for the most expensive whiskey in the bar, into which he dips the nasty tip of the bone, stirring slowly while looking around the bar with its stunned, oblivious witnesses and big belly barkeep before quickly guzzling every drop of the burning amber, the cat says to the dog and an equally stunned audience in the diner, previously predisposed by the four young African-American men who'd entered the diner to dine, all of them now wrapped and wrapped in the yarn being spun by the cat. When the man rose to depart, leaving the bone behind, the bartender snapped, you can't leave that lion there. And the man said, that ain't no lion, man, chuckled the cat. The dog had leapt nimbly to and from the stool, which was one of those tall spinning stools you sometimes find a small child set and spinning upon while the father drinks and bars a phony euphony before stumbling from the bar, like a dog with three legs. But this dog was not like that. Nor is it the kind of dog you might recall turned snarling on the black college students in Greensboro sit-ins in the 60s. It was not a dog like that. But the dog shook its head with the look of someone suddenly violently slapped and then said to the brothers who simply entered the diner to dine, holy shit, it's a goddamn talking cat. I'm gonna stop there, y'all. We just, you know, we had that video for another time. <laughs> All right, that's me. Um. Is it my job now to unmute myself? I think I should unmute myself now. Is that right? Um, they're nodding and saying yes. Terrence, um, I, I'm always so happy to hear Terrence read. I'm really sorry we didn't get the cat voice. Um, but what an amazing like structural imagination Terrence has. It's incredible. And I'm always like really blown away by how much he has um, getting organized in his mind. And I'm just totally, I'm always excited to hear it. Um, I was not gonna do this. I said that I was going to share any of the critical prose that I was working on, but then I said that like, I'm gonna read a couple of paragraphs since we're treating this like a kind of work in progress <laughs> situation. And just a couple of paragraphs because they might actually contextualize uh, the work that I'm doing, which is kind of, uh, a, in, in a transitional moment from the poetry long, long poem that I was working on for a very long time, which I completed, you know, a year ago, really, but then added a couple of poems to over the course of the summer. Um, that work is called Or on Being the Other Woman. And so the larger project, though, involves um, some theorizing about some of the problems that are raised in that poem. And so this is from a little, an essay that I'm working on called Warring which has to do with some problems that I identified in uh, a thousand plateaus. <laughs> I'm laughing because it's ridiculous, but also it was like the source of a lot of, of insight for me. So I'm gonna read a couple of paragraphs and then I'm just gonna read these poems and I'm gonna set a timer right now as well. You will be allowed to live and speak but only after every outlet has been obstructed. That's from A Thousand Plateaus. The sweetness of reading Deleuze without bitterness, credulous, not having invested in the hope of revolution at the moment of the writing, might offer the only glimpse I will ever have of what it is to think like a white man, to think without regard for the wounding potentialities of statements. I cannot imagine such a romance. So aware am I of the price I pay for my ability to read, 
susceptible as I am still to the accusation of being too stupid to write. Heidegger bowls me over. I experience an innocent kind of philosophical drunkenness. I am not in my body. Yet the experience holds within it some agony, a word I cannot say without pressing on Baraka's notes in as agony as now, which begins by setting a scene of torture. I am inside someone who hates me. We know that phrases, statements can become hostile in a real, not metaphorical way. The word I am thinking of is en règlement, and it must be made up because it doesn't exist in the natural grammar of French. I mean it to express imbrication through repetitious juridical activity, relating back to a question such as, how do statements transmit hostility? How do we become aware of and adequately know the derangements of a particular kind of language or talk? Of course, I mean the exciting philosophical talk I just mentioned, which is exciting precisely because it arises from a scene of evil that has come to partially compose or condition my experience. I am inside someone who hates me, or am I? I think I shared this poem with Terrence a long time ago because I wrote it because of him and because of our conversations about Wanda Coleman. I am an ignorant fucker, difficult to be close to in that I am unsentimental and intimate with everyone. This is connected to the problems I'm working through regarding metaphor as a form of patriarchal control over language and a currency of poetic power. My ex-husband calls me an ignorant fucker when I complain that his hugely pregnant white girlfriend who I do not know, who I tolerate, since for the last month and indefinite future, my son must live in her house two days a week, cannot show up unannounced in my child's classroom where I pay all the bills and I watch and half do nothing and half help in the acquisition of literacy and reason. I say, this is no place for this white woman. She is a free rider on my labor and love for my son. I will not support any white people with my work. I tell him all of this pretty loudly. He calls me an ignorant fucker. Now you are street. What are you gonna punch her in the face? I have fought exactly three people with physical violence in my 48 years of life. Two men and my sister. Pain expands the time, ages coil within the minute circumference of the brain. Pain has an element of blank. I am an ignorant fucker. I've learned a lot from Eileen. Lay claim to the processes of your mind. Deal in the maniacal properties of the oscillating sign that is the mark on you, like black is on you, but don't let them force you to sing. All burning prerogative since a rack couldn't coax a syllable now. Emily talking shit versus me being ignorant fucker. What is is, is determining the terms of exaltation, praise and defilement, the turning off and on of the pleasure and pain centers, subjectivation. Profanity's nonce forms engage linguistically in what sound people call muddiness, Profanity's imbrication with epithet is a richer form of meaning, making that taps into sound, sign at a zero level, incredibly powerful, and elementally so. Fuck that mumbling shit. You are an ignorant fucker. What has to be said beyond off, on, good, bad? What happens when a linguistic field is generated by high energy signs across a flat plane of signification? There's no need for logical progression or narrative. Each word or phrase can function as foregone, forethought, already known. That's a black ontological truism that trap music knows deeply. That's its language game. On the one hand, we experience a unidirectional surge. On the other hand, 
intense confusion by a harmonic scrambling. I am an ignorant fucker, wherein the comedic shock of the thing resides in the manner in which I do not resemble and yet am the thing, impossibly misperceived. This is like this. I regard this as baby work, ultra conservative pandering. I seek to dwell outside the figure in a zone of pain. This is my country. What is the difference between the figure that destroys and the figure that breaks away? A. A great puzzling loomed, or was a pall of disorientation occasionally pierced by incompletely appreciating mental acuity. It had possible to remember facts and facts in a previous period, previously, without hesitating so gravely, not being able to speak. I inhabited time densely and so was not dead or deadened, more an aliveness or supposed anxiety that did not turn attention away, trembling nor luminous. It was dense or had mineral qualities, Nothing of ethereal or heavens except its mean dust. Several combinations of not being able to articulate the names of objects first, panicking or shock, being puzzled coming later in relation to initial awareness of heretofore uncontemplated blank spots, both biological, that is neurological, not knowing the names of people or places or things in front of my students, when critically sleep deprived in the first instance, and poetic, objecting to the ordinary orthodox way access to words had been described as a matter of grammar, stymian, as a matter of disability, stuttering, having many words and unable to find them. Also performance of ease with respect to writing, metaphorically invention or creative creativity organized in terms of access to this kind of speech. Morbid fear of flying occasionally flares up, attributable to early incomplete understanding of the phenomenon of wind shear. As a child gathering, a plane could be hurled to the ground by the air. Deducing air travel cannot be completely safe. A plane or engineers not being able to respond mechanically to the force that carries the plane. The principal absurdity of being unable to overcome physics in this basic way, how fucked we are, my own death, to be related to a kind of unresourcefulness of lack of creativity with respect to language, or language's pathetic nature in the face of dimensions, what to call a vestibularity, which sounds very dramatic. Chief Keefe's Save Me, for example, if Chief Keith has Asperger's, I'll be Monkey's uncle. Two kinds of multidimensional imagining have been troubling during the time of this work. I misunderstand grinning for granny, warring for want wreck. It doesn't matter. After all, if looking at a painting or listening to music that doesn't have words, I misunderstand it's considered a function of excess of interpretability. Works having vectors, operational vibrations outside their physical presentation in common understanding, not only Black people's theoretical proposals. By virtue of being in proximity to my peculiarity, the speech of another, what comes out of the body of another now, more likely a long time ago, then almost dying there until it is activated when I come to it. That is the things that actually die that we make perhaps going wrong. Not understanding war, including the sound of a person's spasmodic coughing as a vestibulary element. Once the fundamentals of the so-called beat are established and the other effects, some horns, some amplified weed pulling, 
all of which can be heard by any device. I think it's interesting that the auditory register of the coughing is lumped into a bar with the 808 trout. Impossible to hear. Seconds later, the sound signaling pulmonary illness or distress, ancillary to vocal strain. No one arrives with the intention to suffocate. P look darker, I hear as penis darker. The gathering or clearing in which verbalization will begin to take place is already jammed up. Warring being on the mind of this man whose lungs can't fill up with either smoke or air. He says nothing, grunts or counts, saying nothing technically. Imagining a gnarled or entwined figure in which all the intentions of love are activated, all its disappointment hovering as a fundamental magnetism in the gaps where two bodies do not touch, where perhaps the hips of two persons attached at the genitals form the angle at which two human bodies move away from one another. This is also a space of containment. So a formation in the physical world of particulate refusal, its essence isn't contamination, having a problem associated with its physical properties toward destroying the connection. Its hold is touching too much rather than too little. Little language being necessary. Any first person declaration involving will not. The sculptural gap between the bodies in terms of the recurrence of the figure a total imaginary, sometimes filled with nothing, but disdain for the other will. I guess it is domination. The point's ultimate non-linguistic origin or location in the explosion inside empty space of the wills that takes place at an anti-material level before any kind of sex between the figures could be considered. Sex really being a consequence of the wild inexplicable space the gap having an aesthetic quality that is my own understanding to make of living in the future or in other nightmares unrelated to any kind of writing. Anyone living in disproportionate awareness of the chaos that is the gathering of intentional speech within the possibly violent dance of being gathered as minimally to, they spitting and accusing one another in the gap that both holds them and defines an impossible difference. It's unclear how this could be heard as nothing. What the man is saying is a declaration of total war, and so exactly. The man being an innovator and also a threat, and aggressively misunderstood as a matter of general agreement to be not saying anything. Whether or not the man believes himself to be writing and is consumed as a messenger. Imagining I get into trouble personally, Sometimes it is possible to avoid the viciousness of white people, often because of money. Only in the middle of my life, apprehending myself, my gender, as a different kind of target. When Taryn says, a nigger can't survive, he isn't talking about me. Taking getting into trouble as an idiom. I would be into a posture of warring at this time that can be ignited by disrespect. The twitchy readiness into which I have grown, standing in the kitchen listening to war. I want to affirm, I hear this man saying words. His life is so strong and reaching me. Let me survive without stealing. Okay. So I'm glad that the progress of this of this group has been around poetry in the census because one of the things I want to like show in this reading, not necessarily like in the book, is that the book is like just filled with emotion, just like raw emotion that can't necessarily be organized into like affects or something like that. And um so I'm going to read this one last thing, which I will probably take up all our time. No man has ever not tried to steal from me. That's wrong. The man who never tried to steal from me never wanted to be with me like that. 
while the man I was with who explicitly stole from me was so crazy at the time, I didn't think much of it structurally, or I could not think structurally at the time. In California, prairie light and scenes from Midwinter Day were coming to me in a confusing way via social media. I wrote to Laura, I had a dream in which I was overcome or beset by a kind of erotic storm, encircled by lovers. That is, men of whom I would say fucking is eternally in the nature of our bond. The transmutational properties of masculinity, the three forcefully whipping around me, having become a cosmos of presence to myself, my nieces with no share of the bearing down. Inside their fucking gyre, I transmitted a signal for help, but it could not escape because the force of the dimensions with which they were or were creating was a black hole. The real blackness of the hole was true. I woke up knowing what words to say. Say the dream, Laura. Within two or three days, I had been trying to identify the name of the pressures. No, I cannot remember what any of them had done to me. I try to remember forming an intention. Now I am going to act as crazy as possible and threaten to go to his job and tell his mama and his best friend what kind of person he is and how he has been stealing from me all these years and telling people I'm a spoiled bitch because I have all these degrees and won't take my baby out of private preschool. So I was acting crazy and smoking out the window of my house, screaming into the garden at the morning dusk looking at me like I was crazy. I stopped when he said a number, I guess. I can't remember much about it because I got pretty drunk afterward and woke up in the night thinking, Lord, I am not able to do this much longer. Please let this man see my humanity. In two or three days also, I had learned there was no name for the pressures. It was the most ordinary black womanhood which is not nameless, has all the names of us, and is nameless, and has no intention, and is strategic. One of the days, a young dancer came up to me and said, I don't know how to embody the musical problems. And I said, well, how does it make you feel? I began to be able to speak of it myself when I felt myself growing more graphically male through its practice. I listened at deafening loudness in my car, Clearly, I am trying to hurt myself. The words they say, they have a newness. I promise never to speak the words in my poems, not in defiance of interpretation, but because they are so creepily hostile and unfunny. The interior they assume in address so murderous, I don't see the point of repeating them. This is what words do. How does it make you feel? You are not allowed to have feelings. You are not allowed to have anything. And when you have something, somebody will try to take it from you. Don't doubt it for a second. There is no honor in patriarchy. It is a drug. Sometimes I allow my eyes to roll back in its vicious pleasure. I can feel joy if I remember. I am feeling the power of myself as a vacuous thing, an unknown thing, out of which words come under pressure begin to make new, so that the structure of the poem was falling down around me, as were the constitutive energies of what I was, such as they were visible or detectable to me. I sensed them breaking. They were already broken. This was the condition of which the poem must consist. The radiant materiality of circuitous attacks, some such as might be deflected, Others helplessly slip inside what is. I'll stop there. Yeah. Y'all, y'all are making me so happy. I'm having this like Kave Kanem flashback moment to kind of what those what those readings were when folks um, spent time in workshop and then, you know, came together every evening and people were reading the new things that they were writing. Um, you are amazing humans for sharing stuff that is so that's so new and that you're still sort of thinking through and thinking with with all of us. Um, also, I just want to acknowledge how amazing it is to have the two of you 
on the virtual Berkeley stage together. This is like a dream lineup. Um, and I'm really happy to get the chance to ask you some questions and just sort of dig more into the poetry. I have all these all these pages and pages of notes. I've been scrawling phrases and things and all of this. And I was just thinking, um, yeah. And I said, well, how does it make you feel, Terrence, when you're reading the practice of a poem should be what archeology span makes you feel blow glowing red in the dark room. How does it make you feel? Where are words connected? How's this all working? Um, so excited to get to ask you questions. Um, so I wanna kick off. I wanna kick us off with a question for both of you. Um, maybe Terrence, I'll, I'll ask you to answer it first. It's a gen general kind of question about genre. Um, this is, what is a quality or asset or attribute of poetry that attracts you to it? Um, what is this genre in particular asks or allowed you to ask or allow you to do? Um. Good to be here with y'all. First of all, I want to say I'm so mad. I should have gone second, man, because as soon as Simone went, I was like, oh, man, I had like a set of poems to read for her. And then I was like, should I answer these questions that y'all sent me? And at the end, I was like, well, you know, Simone's not paying me. So I, I did a room that nope. was in direct relationship to all of, your, all of your questions. So I would say to you on that, like, yeah, I mean, I wound up just sort of reading poems oriented around these questions of like, what I think about poetry, how I'm trying to move through it. Um, I chose a bunch of ones that were sort of, you know, formal. Although what I've really been working on is closer to the voice in that very most recent poem, which is sort of getting at that kind of like almost allegorical but intimate voice, which goes to Simone. That's what I was thinking as she was reading, because I have, as I said, really also since uh, April, I've just been writing like these weird quatrains. I got like 18 pages of them. And so I had when I was thinking I was just going to read for her, I was like, I'm just going to read these things. I've never read them out. And then I sort of chickened out, which makes me say to you, uh, you know, she was braver than I was in terms of the copy kind of thing, you know, because I wound up not reading the things that have what I really love in her work, which is a kind of like intellectual transparency, like intellectual richness that runs through that work where you can see the mind working and it's just doing all these, going all these directions. So anyway, I, I love that in the work. That's always inspiring to me. And I felt like, oh, you just got a little bit of that tonight. But um, but you did get, you know, what I like in poems, uh, stuff to push against, things to imagine, things to play with. Um, how about that as an initial answer to everything? I love it as an initial answer. And I think I can speak for everybody to say that if you want to jump in and read another poem specifically at any point, nobody's going to be mad at you. <laughs> I'm just no, no, the, the conversation will be good, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Simone, your thoughts about this? Um, why poetry? Why this form? What does it What does it give you? Um, I think the answer is it, it's um, it's it's the sort of the way. I mean, right now I'm struggling with the fact that there's so many people who who have important things to say about Black life. That um, can you guys still hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, that that seem to point to poetry as like a problem solver or something like that. Like there's a way in which the term like poetics or poetics keeps coming up in the, in the, in the sort of, in the world of, of like solutions, but it doesn't seem like, I, I'm not really always sure like how my own poems like are poetry or something like that, but I have, hope that like disorganization of, of words and, and trying to like reconstitute the things that can be said, you know, like totally based on an individual's esoteric approach um, does have a really interesting and important role to play in trying to understand like what the world really looks like and what it might look like in the future. So I guess that's the answer about, you know, why, po why poetry. Um, I wanted to start by asking that because both of you, I mean, Simone, when you said works having, you know, when you read about works having vectors, that just felt so completely electric for me because I was, yeah, I feel like that's exactly Terrence. So many of the poems are about interacting with um, things outside the world of the poem, right? Like that, that they are, they, they become part of the world of the poem. So yeah, just figuring figuring this out, thinking about it. Um, and also both of y'all are really brave in your creative practices, right? Um, in the kinds of spaces that you move into. Terrence, like 
all of the incredible visual work that you're doing. I mean, it's some of some of it that you shared. You know, I'm always really excited to think about what are the what are the different sort of the differences um, and why something calls out to be a poem and why something comes out in a different in a different form. Um, uh, can I just say first of all, you know, beggars can't be choosers. That's my relationship yeah. to, to creativity. Certainly, poetry is that way too. So it's like whatever comes. You know, you take that and you just sort of run with it. Um, other than that, you know, I, I think that's pretty much my answer to all of it. I don't, I don't even know until I sort of look back at what I've been doing. But on the way to it, you're just trying to be happy to get something down. You know, I mean, I, was that a question? I don't know if you asked a question. I thought I was answering a, answering a question. But yeah, I'm like, yeah, whatever comes. I mean, whether it's art or whether it is, I'm just like doing the best I can is what I would tell you. That's how it feels to me all the time. It never feels as maybe easy as it looks. Um, and how about this? Here's a real answer for you. Like what I was trying to demonstrate through all of that, when I said the thing about like, you know, George Floyd is that like my impulse is really to just sort of be absorbed in it. And I would say half of my work is like, you know, stuff I don't show. So if I'm saying to you, I was writing these things, you know, uh, anyway, working on this sort of process and then deciding now, like, is that what, would I share that? Should I share that? And I, you know, um, versus sort of saying like, my idea is just to kind of, oh, I'll just do a sonnet and I don't think about anything else. So I'll do this. And then saying like, that sort of changes when the, uh, the world is literally at your doorstep. But my impulse is to be like, I'm in my room. You know what I mean? My impulse in the best universe is to not want to engage with anybody. I just want to be here, you know? Just making stuff, uh, and I think that obviously the world we live in does not allow, <laughs> even though it seems to be quarantined. The world we're in does not allow for that kind of isolation. So you know, so you engage. I wondered about that. One of the things that you shared with us, students at Kabe Kanem, um, was back in the day, um, and I don't know if this is still true for your writing, that you write best when you are at home. But when you're traveling, you're saying. You told us you shared with us. You know, I don't. I don't write poems in that exterior space. You said that you wrote play. That you you made playlists and you wrote poetry prompts. Of course, we're always following you, asking for poetry prompts. Mm -hmm. um, how is making working for you in this moment? You know, and this for both of you actually. Simone, would you like to jump in on this? Like, what is what is this moment doing for with you and your your creative work? Mm. Um, I mean, the biggest challenge is. Uh, I think for me have to do with the fact that for the first, you know, eight weeks of the pandemic, uh, my son and I were here alone together. Just my six year old and I were just here together. He, he splits his time between two households and, you know, like in that, in that moment of uncertainty, I, I just like, as his like panicky mom was like, I'm sorry, he's not leaving the house. And so, but that meant that I was embracing um, being completely alone with a six-year-old who was at that time five and Zoom kindergarten is what I embraced really. And also teaching online. So it was really sort of coming to terms with the loss of, of choices about how I use my time during, during in life and, you know, how, how this period was going to, you know, if, if my impulse to stay safe with my, child and eventually he did resume his visits and all of that but but you know which are two two days a week but um it was really about um like the loss of what I had taken for granted in the past of things like school as you know uh, um and playgrounds and public spaces and you know a kind of acceptance of not getting any work done. Um, it's been a really interesting year. I mean, you know, just kind of like having, being both like in conflict with, with the limited amount of time I have to work. And also, you know, in the same way that I had to change my relationship to work when I became a parent, I had to change my relationship to work over the course of this last year so that I didn't feel like, I don't know, useless or something like, like, you know, like, just like my productivity was going to become about cooking 21 meals a week or, or something like that instead of, you know, and that became a different kind of productivity. Status, I mean, housekeeping, one day I'm going to say more about housekeeping. I, you know, I, 
I feel strongly about <laughs> cleaning. And, um, you know, the incredible satisfaction I was getting at one point of, of just like bleach was like a thing that became really important to me to think about. And, you know, but, you know, my, my, my productivity has increased. My own creative work has become more like real over the course of the last six months as, as you know, like children return to in-person school and, um, you know, I'm on leave for the first time in my life. I have never had a sabbatical before. And so my leave began uh, this January. I immediately got sick <laughs> for two months. I didn't get COVID, but I did get sick. <laughs> and so I'm really, I feel like I'm like getting on the horse in a way that I had been off the horse for a long time in the course of the last year. And I'm grateful that, you know, I had this manuscript ready to go to, to publication and that I had conceived of an entire project that was really a growth of my artistic practice and so far as it wasn't just, I'm talking too much, but it was like, it wasn't just poetry. It was, it was a sound project and a, and a project that involved my relationship to theory. And it was like kind of ready to go, but it couldn't go. And so now just like, it feels incredibly awkward <laughs> to be, you know, like I really don't know how to do any of the things that are before me at the moment. But yeah. I love that you use the word awkward. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and I also love that um, how how gener generous you are about answering that question and like really digging in and talking about it, Terrence. Oh, really I was talking too much, but <laughs> okay, no, not in this venue. No such thing. Um, Terrence, has this time changed your relationship to work in any way? Is there anything? No, I mean, you know, my, my ideal situation is just to, just to do that, and nothing else. I work in the other direction of trying to like, you know, like I was like, I get out every now and again, you know, I get out like once a day that feels really healthy for me to be like, I went and bought a coffee. So it's the opposite of trying to like engage. This is what I was, the analogy again, of just like protesters marching by and my impulse is, you know, that I'm working and to have to go out into the world. So, uh, and I think that's always a struggle really, you know, whether to go outside or inside for me personally. Uh, but you know, I don't, uh, I don't live like a whole bunch of other people, you know, like I had a family once and I still see my family. I still care very deeply for them, but you know, here I am. This is like the choice I made, which is to be here only doing art. It's why I still have a great relationship with my family because they're like, oh, you know, dad is just hold up working on a poem. You know, and so uh, that's what I do pretty much. That's like my best life is that one. So the quarantine, as I said, in a certain way, it's like a great thing, but I had to sort of be like, okay, let me see if I can uh, do better. Let me see if I can get out now that people are saying you don't have to get out. Well, I do want to say that I, Terrence, I consider to be my friend. And I, and I, um, I do sometimes ask myself, what would Terrence do if I'm having trouble working? <laughs> Because I know that that is a standard that like I really, you know, I, I cannot get there, but I, you know, I do think about, you know, what it is to be absorbed in a different way and not be so distracted. If you could both go back in time to like that moment before COVID hit and give yourselves a piece of pre-lockdown advice, what would you, what would you tell your, your future self? Uh, so the piece I pulled out for that one was the thing that I wrote. It was in March. Um, and that thing was about Kobe Bryant. And I had thought in, you know, January, February, uh, that that was going to be a story like Roberto Clemente. I was like, this is going to be the biggest story for five years that Kobe Bryant died. We'll never get over it. I have friends who've never gotten over, as I said, Roberto Clemente passed, passing away. And then this happened. So that's just sort of saying that it's, you never really know what's coming. I mean, I wouldn't change anything. It's such a great lesson like when i hear people talking even simone when people talk about like how hard the year was i agree but i'm like it's the hardest year in a thousand years like i mean we're getting exactly what you would expect of a kind of momentous moment like this this is like the bubonic plague or something i mean there's is there anything precedent for it? so it just allows for your shot to be um shameless is what i would say so i i certainly feel like that again the opposite for me i just like 
cut off all of my, I have barely any kind of connection with like social media and email and even texting. I'm sort of, I treat texting almost like email, which is like, I might text you back in a day or two. So I'm saying like, I only realized maybe this month that that was probably a symptom of, <laughs> of the pandemic. Cause I was just like, I don't want to talk to nobody. I just want to be like, they can't come get me now if I don't respond. So I'm not going to respond, you know? And so again, to me, what I circled back to was like, oh yeah, that's trauma too, you know, because I had been so busy saying to everybody who feels so um, individual in the shock of last year, they feel so like I wasn't ready. I didn't do my best. I wasn't my best self. I got high all day. I did, you know, all the ways that people are sort of beating themselves up about 2020. I'm like, come on, man. It was like, it was 2020. I don't, I don't, you know, it's, there's nothing to compare it to. So whatever you, whatever your response to is a fair response at the end of the day. I mean, especially now we got rid of Trump, but you know, like when you add that into all of that, obviously that was a very hard, in addition to toxic because of him, very hard year. So there is no uh, wrong response is what I think. There is no wrong response. And finally, even my children who've seen, you know, I talk like this all the time. So my kids are very like crisis adept. They know how to think through stuff. They get problem solvers, all of that stuff. So they did very well. My son's rage went up. My daughter was doing all this stuff. And I was like, you can break down later, you know, like, Sometimes the trauma is later. So even if you've done well in real time, I'm still not saying to you, congratulations. I'm saying to you, you can still break down. I mean, there's no there's no expiration date on your response to how crazy that year was. Even if in real time, it looks like you're still on your feet. So I'm saying to you, I, I say that to everybody, my students, my friends, like it was a wild year, you know. For me, again, I'm just more adept to, you know, being in a cave. So it still was hard, as I said, but I, I do say like whatever your struggle was last year is was fair because there's never been a year like that simone how about you future self like if you could have gone back in time and given yourself advice for navigating this moment this year i don't know i mean one of my wise friends you know i used to reject his thoughts about um the sort of long slow slide of human civilization <laughs> You know, like, I really did. I thought it was, you know, an avid reader of science, you know, all this, you know, who was always talking about, you know, drought and pandemics and this kind of stuff. But I, I was like, oh, uh, that's not, that's not science fiction. That's actually the world in which we should prepare to live a world where there are pandemics and a world in which there's less water and a world in which you know, it behooves you to think about what would happen if white supremacists descend on your town. You know, um, and I really did start thinking more, you know, in a kind of end of times way, but it wasn't like I was sad about it or anything. I just recognized that, you know, that I was in a way living in a kind of isolation that was probably dangerous. And, um, that I needed to make better preparations for myself. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, I, I'm also incredibly fortunate. You know, I, I am incredibly fortunate and I don't, I almost never use the word privilege, but I do use the word fortunate. Like just so much luck and so much um, um, good fortune, you know? Um, and so, I have felt that, you know, I have felt the importance of luck this last year or so. Um, just like how it really could have been different, you know, in so many different ways. I have a question about heroes. In the heaven, we're going to discover that Octavia Butler is God. That's what I was writing down the other day because she's the only person that predicted all of this stuff, like mm -hmm. so on the money with everything. So I'm like, Oh, she was God the whole time. We didn't even know it. And then you'll get there. She'd be like, ah. So that's my hunch on how crazy things are. Who was, who had the correct foresight on it? So what I was going to ask y'all on that, actually, that might be an answer to it right there, um, is about heroes. Like, who are your heroes right now? You know, who or what is inspiring you kind of in your work or in your life more generally? So maybe mm -hmm. one answer is Octavia Butler. Yeah, I have a sister. Did I send you that thing, I, those drawings I did of Octavia Butler with her head and people getting inside the head, Simone? I probably sent you that in a text or something at some point. Uh, I can't work a poem out, though. I'm still working out a, a poem on her. But yeah, it's always in the work. So, you know, all of those little 
uh, drawings of people that I'm doing. I mean, I, if I, I'm working on something about uh, Gwendolyn Brooks now, and I spent most of the last couple of months working on something for Yusuf, who has a selector coming out. So again, I just try to, you know, I just try to um, show it in the work, whoever it is, you know, um, how about that? Like, you know, I, I think that I try to make something for those people that I believe in or that, that guide me. Yeah, I think those kinds of tributes are really, um, I try to bring that stuff out like in the work in a different kind of way. Um, I feel like honestly, like Lynn Higinian has been a real guidepost for me, especially in the last year. Um, you know, and part of it is that she is here with us, you know, and so, you know, the importance of having elders who, who are here you know, and sort of recognizing the importance of, of their example while they're still here. I've been really like aware of that. I also have to say like my mother who is, um, you know, I mean, she's my mother <laughs> and therefore <laughs> we have conflict. But also my mother's, I've said this a couple of times, I think in readings, but it must, that must be because it's on my mind. Like um, she is wise, you know, and, and I have been really aware of her emotional, um, the extent of her um, emotional range in a way that I think I was not as a younger woman. And, um, and I have been really admiring that about her and trying to sort of like be more gentle with myself as a parent also, because I know that, you know, I have, I have terrible, I have terrible, like, temper management skills. <laughs> I'm the most impatient mother in the whole universe. But I, um, you know, just trying to recognize like the humanity that my mother has exhibited um, towards me and towards other people like as an adult has been really like important this year, especially this year, because I've been physically separated from her, I'm sure is why I haven't seen my mother since December of 2019. But um, yeah, that's been on my mind. Cool, cool. I love it. I just seen a picture of her. I totally believe that picture of her sitting on the beach looking over her shoulder. You know this picture I'm talking about? Yeah. It's, so <laughs> it's all in me. It's true. I keep wanting. I do survive. I don't know what your questions are going to be, but I do. I mean, I think of Simone. It's just not that many people. I was saying this to some one the other day, someone who was like thinking they were going to be my friend. I was like, I don't really have no friends. You know what I mean? I just have like poets I love that I am very close to because um, I don't know how to talk about anything else, you know? So like, I, I just knew I was going to get so much good energy from Simone. And so, yeah, you know, that's what it is. Like, I love you too, Terrence. <laughs> Give me such good energy. It's always true. It's always true. Can I ask y'all to talk more about parenting, parenthood, thinking about parents and writing? Because that's that's one of the through lines. Like when I'm when I'm reading your work, and especially in these last couple of weeks, when I was thinking about this conversation, it was just the thing that jumped out. There, there are a couple of things. One of them is 1970s, right? And being kids of the 70s. And the other piece of it is um is really, yeah, thinking of thinking about parenthood and childhood and those those experiences. Um where is that going in your work now? Is that a part of these new things that you're writing or that you're thinking about or the things that you're kind of still wrestling with trying to figure out how to make? I have a poem, um, like I tell you, I mean, it's a poem that's on the New Yorker, Pseudicus Crucifer is a poem that's sort of thinking about these kinds of questions. How about that? Can I say that? Um, that there's, there's work out there because you know, obviously I, I've already alluded to it. I think, um, like my son, 17, he's still in Pittsburgh. Uh, he came up here and actually, you know, his mom came too, uh, who's a poet, Yona. Uh, they came up in March, you know, and hung out or whatever. And then they left a week before everything closed down. So now he really won't come back because he's 17. He's got such a great excuse, you know, to kind of like make me pay. So that's kind of how I think about it. It's very complicated, but like everything he does um, to keep me from like getting close to him, I'm always like, yeah, yeah, you know, I deserve it, I deserve it. So I always say to him, well, you know, if you want to go into therapy when you're in your 30s and you want me to join, I'll come, I'll be there. So I'm sort of saying that added to, you know, just the natural stuff about a father not being with his son added to, you know, the pandemic. So 
I don't know. I don't know where, but you know, I, I say that to say like we have a great relationship, but I, I still never feel like I'm quite as close as I need to be, if you know what I mean. So he's he's a total like great kid. He's smart and he's like respectful and all of that. And I still feel like not close enough. So, but that's a very personal thing. Um, it's still in the work, and I do I do try to write about it. I do try to articulate it. So that's why I would say like we ain't got time to necessarily hear that poem. But that's. Um, I worked on it for like three or four years and I read it to him like, you know, for his birthday, for his 15th birthday. So I like worked on it for a year and I was like, I want to make you listen to this thing. And then my parents were there. And then so uh, I guess last year I finally sent it to the New Yorker and I was like, I'm going to send that poem off. I worked on it. You know, he was like, oh, that's cool. I'll look for it. So so there's that. You know, as I said, I just try to keep a record of this stuff. Almost anything you ask me, you know, if I've thought about it, I hope I can find some evidence of it in the work. So that's what that one would be. Do you lean, do you find yourself leaning into emotional difficulty and emotional complexity in your work because of what you're learning about complexity as a parent? I think poetry, that's what poetry is. It's like a development of intellectual, you know, emotional intelligence. How about that? I think so much of what poetry is, it's like the more you do it, the more emotionally intelligent you become. How useful that is everywhere else, I don't know. But to me, it's a very useful uh, thing to be happening when you're doing the work, like asking yourself these critical questions. And again, I see that in Simone's work uh, in ways that I'm not always like painting over it. Once I've sort of really done that emo you know, emotional work, I'm like turning around and deciding how productive it is, which is not always the, the best way to go at, you know, what we call emotional intelligence. Sometimes you can be too smart with that. So, so I'll say like, you know, again, being super frank, and again, I just think this because Simone is on it. That is what I struggle with because I do know how to like, you know, shape things. Uh, and so the challenge is like, oh, you know, vulnerability is power, vulnerability is power. So, and I always struggle with that. I don't always act accordingly, but that is ultimately what I believe. That's what I'm sort of working towards in the work at this point. Um, so again, I hope that I'm, I'm talking about everything, being a dad, being a poet, being a human being, like moving towards something that allows yourself to see that as a, an absolute truth that the more open you are and the more, that, that really is what power is, being open. Simone, would you be willing to talk about this? I mean, I'm actually almost embarrassed to sort of ask that question because I feel like y'all have already given all of us readers so much of this in the work itself. Um, and it feels almost greedy of me to just say, ask you to say more about, about this, but I, it's beautiful and it's fascinating. And I also want to say on behalf of my students, um, people would be mad at me if I hadn't asked that question. Um, I remember one time in particular, Terrence teaching, um, your Pachachkas from the book Lighthead in a class um, and having folks, we basically had to stop sort of that class and do a kind of like have basically like a workshop moment and really talk about, okay, so parent child, parent child, what do we need to say right now just in this room, in this space, so then we can step back into this poem. So yeah, thank you for indulging my, my greediness and my desire to hear more of both of your wisdom. I'll send him in advance next time, and then we'll be more surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I thought about that. I thought about that too. I just, I just didn't want to spring anything on you. That it's a pandemic, y'all. I'm not trying to spring anything on people right now that anybody isn't going to hear about ahead of time. It just feels wrong. Teasing. I'm teasing. Um, well, I do. I do talk about children. I talk about being a mom and a little bit, but also like you know, my experience of motherhood has been not like some people's experience of motherhood in so far as like, I was like really shaken up by my son's early childhood. And, um, you know, but, and we have, and he has become, you know how some people, I used to have aunties and stuff who would be like, I don't really like children. I like you all. <laughs> I did not feel that. Like I, I thought that I was a person who loved children, you know, and I, and I find that I love other people's children like a lot, I love being around other people's children and especially babies. But my God, I was so traumatized by my son's early life. And, and, you know, part of it was that, you know, I was, I didn't, I was in the wrong relationship, all of this. And so I needed to separate myself from that situation. But um, I, I wonder, you know, one of my favorite poems of Terrence's is this Michael Jackson poem, which is about early childhood. I think that poem is like an amazing and great American poem. And um, I thought a lot about it and I thought a lot about the ways in which it's sort of like, it's like an anti-psychoanalytic poem or something. <laughs> 
but it's, it's, um, and, but it talks about the ways in which like our own, like we never, we're like always a child, always the ch- a child, you know, and, and always, and so my relationship with my son in a lot of ways, I think is, is fueled by, you know, my own feelings of like being an inadequate child. Like I was like, you know, a child who was never fully inhabiting childhood or something. Like I was always like, I don't like to play. I don't like to, you know, I don't like to dress up. I don't like, I don't like that, you know, but I, his joy in his own childhood is like completely challenging my sense of who I was as a child and the ways in which he is not anxious the way I was as a baby, you know, like a young, he's six and, you know, like I can see he doesn't feel anxiety that I felt every time I entered the classroom as a six-year-old, you know, he doesn't feel the gender anxiety that I felt. He doesn't feel, you know, he just, he's comfortable in his body. And I just like, love it. I, I love, I love that security, you know, like I love watching it develop and I hope that I have a part to play in it, you know, but I do think some of it is not me. And, um, yeah, and so us growing together, you know, like really growing with him and seeing how, you know, like we are not opposed to one another in our in our life together. Like we are really kind of like taking this journey together, particularly because I'm an older parent, I think. Um, I know, I'm, I love, my kid is amazing. <laughs> I feel so lucky to have been given the person who I have been given to care for, who is what I can do, you know? I have not been given more than I can do. I think that's actually like another thing. But yeah, super blessed to have him. There is a really terrific and maybe adjacent question in the chat um, that I wanna share. And this is actually for you, Simone, too. so this is coming from Vincente Perez. Um, it says, hello, Simone. I'm wondering if you'll talk a little bit more about why you turn to poetry and poetics when you feel like you want to address raw emotions that don't quite manifest as affect. Mm. Apologies, I forget your specific phrasing. Um, well, because I have been struggling with uh, a thousand plateaus <laughs> for the last month, I also want to say, like, I know that affect is the word that Deleuze and Guattari use to express a kind of unformed emotion, and I am not using it in that way. I guess the way I'm using it is, um, um, so, so like, authorized feeling or something like that is what I'm interested in thinking about. I'm interested in thinking about, like, the ways in which the lived life is never really in line with the feelings that we have, um, we could write down words that we know for the feelings and um, the ways in which therefore like our sense of what it would mean to like be free or something like that, to have like a fully free existence can also not be embraced by any of those feelings because it's too complicated, right? Like the, the sense that like one could have, you know, like, pure romantic love or something like that could never, or I am in love that could never be expressed by any language that we have, like a single word or group of words can never express the sort of complex of humiliation and sex and joy that, you know, is really being in love, you know? Um, And so I'm interested in like how poetry can help us to um, mine, you know, the full language, the full capacity of language to fill ourselves up, you know, with the possible expressions for those feelings. And that does involve like grabbing and saying language of other kinds of description, you know, that's why materiality, that's why I'm so focused on matter and materiality right now, because it seems like I'm just like actually just filling up the tank a little bit to try and think about how um, you know, the states that I experience um, could be described better. And that's not for me, it's actually for everybody. You know, I really believe that. It doesn't really matter about my like personal problems in love and stuff, it really doesn't. But it does matter that we have like a record of, um, of that. 
that those like efforts, you know? That's one of the things that I admire so much about both of your writing um, is your willingness to write autobiographically adjacent speakers. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and really, and and use use that as a kind of a way to explore things. Um, let me let me ask another question from the chat. This is uh, for you, Terence. Um, this is from Saeed Farah. Um, asks, what was the experience of writing the George Floyd piece like for you, and how did you navigate such a visceral topic in your body while writing it? Did the audiovisual approach help? Yes to everything uh certainly that helped but again i can only talk about it anecdotally um and about it next to my typical approach to writing so even the last poem i was talking about um the poem for my son where i i was happy to have that to work on that's just usually my attitude like if i got something to work on tomorrow i almost don't want to solve it it's not like you know there's not a final coming anyway so i like to have things like that um so i, I was working on something and then it what happened was i just sort of went out um, I left my work, I went to the park. I'm not that far from Washington Square Park, which is where everybody was meeting for that first protest. And it's just like, I, so I was in the front because I heard them coming. I didn't wait that long. There was thousands of people behind. So I was really right at the front of it as soon as I walked out. Um, and when we got there, there just sort of wasn't any, I've said this before in a few podcasts, there was like, no one knew what to say. You know, someone had a bullhorn and we had like the chance, but there wasn't anything else. And so it wasn't that I thought, oh, if I had a poem necessarily, I don't know if that was, if we live in that kind of moment anymore, but I was imagining it for myself, again, Matt, to go to this idea of the body of like, well, what would I do if this was a moment where somebody cared, you know? So I just thought about it. And again, as I woke up the next morning, I just, I guess I dreamed about it. I don't know where it came from. That's why I'm saying I can only talk about it anecdotally because maybe only three times in all the poems that I've written has a poem really just sort of, Got, I let a poem go without sitting with it for more than like a month. <laughs> that's, that's pretty true. So uh, with this one, I, I wrote it at noon and I mailed it at one so that I wouldn't keep poking at it because I was trying to capture um, what's in that question. And also saying, you know, if you could sum it up, I don't know, like, would you write the poem? You know what I mean? Like I sort of think often about those kinds of poems. Uh, as soon as I can start explaining those things, um, it's probably like I've read it too much if I can really tell you everything that's going on in it. So that would just be, you know, one of those examples of, yeah, I, I was just doing all the work um, to work it out. Um, the drawings I had done the last time, I think it was when the, the guy got killed in the Walmart in Ohio with the, with the gun. Um, and so I had done drawings just sort of thinking about that. And then I wrote the poem and after I wrote it, like I was like, oh, you know what? I could maybe put these things together because it was just a way again of like, one to be absorbed by that as opposed to like watching the news or whatever else people do in those kinds of moments. So I, I didn't want to be online. So that was just sort of the, the yield of that, I guess. Now I'm really curious. It's something that um, that you said earlier about um, writing, trying to write an Octavia Butler poem right now and the challenges with it. How are you working through the, that challenge of not being yet ready to write that poem? What What is that process look like? Have something to work on. I mean, you have to convince yourself of these things. I don't think, you know, we don't live in such a way that people think uh, time is something that's really, you know, the more you think about time, the better you can manage things. So I say to you, my approach to that is just like, oh, that'll be good when it happens. I mean, I have been working on that thing for probably two years. I got like these drawings. I try to sustina and I try some other kinds of things to sort of make it work. Um, and so, you know, at some point it'll work out. And when it does, I'll be excited. But that thing, even about saying, you know, oh, she'll probably be God is because I haven't finished the piece yet. So as long as I don't finish it, I get to keep thinking about her in that kind of way. And at some point it'll reach a critical mass and then I'll know what it is I'm 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 trying to do. But of course she has been in my mind very much through the pandemic. Uh, and even when Trump was in office, I just felt like she anticipated a lot of these kinds of dynamics. So she has been looming very large and, you know, she hadn't been gone that long. So. So anyway, I'm sort of saying to you, I like to think about it. I'm not in any rush to resolve it. Like, why would I be? It's not like anybody's waiting for poems. That's that's generally how I think about it. Like, there's enough good poems in the world. You won't die if I don't get my Octavia Butler poem together. So I just take my time, you know, a year, two years. Whenever it happens, I'll be like, totally worth it is what I, that's how I think about it. Like, I mean, I'm always writing about five poems at a time anyway. And, you know, they just, they all take, you know, long time to get cooked up. So 
Yeah, how about that? I mean, you know, who knows? But I don't, I don't mind it. I don't mind not knowing yet what it is. Simone, how about for you? Those moments of poetic, or however long or short they are, moments of poetic difficulty, difficulty in making. How do you, how do you work with or through those? I feel like I am always having. Dif- I have difficulty. <laughs> I, I'm just really slow, super slow, and often, and I don't write all the time or every day, and I often wait until. I, I tend to work out the problems slowly, you know, like, you know, my friend Imani Perry is like one of also my gurus when it comes to like work habits and stuff. And um, she used to tell me she would write for seven minutes at a time, like when her children like had their backs turned or something. And I was like, I could never do that. And I still can't do it. I, I can't, I actually can't divide my attention in that way. But what I do, I think is I have a little storage system in my brain and I'm not really fully, it's not fully conscious. And I actually prefer it that way. Um, That a lot of this stuff, this process, these processes take place in a place that is not fully, you know, at the, at the surface of thinking. And um, so as the problems are being worked out, um, they are sometimes concealed from me. And then as they come to the surface, they become more and more urgent. So it's like, I, I then really do have to, uh, I begin to have moments where I have to sit down to write things down or something like that. Um, they're like kind of coming out and, and it's sort of like an infection. <laughs> you know? It's like truly a thing that's sort of taking place growing without my full knowledge of what it is. And, but it's okay. I'm, I'm at peace with it like the slowness of my writing and the fact that I have never, I wonder what will happen, you know, when, when time looks different to me, I don't, I can't imagine um, what I've never been fast when I had nothing to do. I wasn't fast. And now that I have lots to do, I'm still not fast. So, um, and I do regard that as a kind of difficulty, but maybe it's not wrong. It's just how I yeah. am. Yeah. It's just how you work. You know? It's not a problem. I have another question from the chat for you, Simone. This one is about um, music. This comes from um, Ken We know who's one of the Poetry in the Census fellow and also a music professor here at UC Berkeley. Um, so Ken writes, I saw that you taught a class on trap music at Penn, which is amazing and awesome. Ken has two questions. One, what do you think about the preponderance of the triplet in trap music as compared to other styles of rap? Is there typically less rhythmic variance in the flow? Is it limiting? So that's question one. Okay, question two, uh, and or are there affo- other affordances, which I love the phrasing of that. Um, question two from Ken is this, are there any points of resonance between trap music and your work? Thank you. I feel like I got a pre- quick preview of of some of that conversation. And I'm so excited we get to go there tonight. So Ken, thank you for sending that question. Oh my goodness. Um, I did teach a class on trap music and I, I've been thinking so much about what I would do differently next time. Um, but, okay, so rhythmic variation and the trip. So I don't, you know, I cannot, I'm not a musician. I know almost nothing about music theory, but I do, you know, I think about resonance and I think about repetition and I think about uh, vibrations, let's put it that way. And so the place of the place of trap music in my work, first of all, in my current work is it is at the very center of my current work, like thinking about the ways in which trap music um, has conditioned like my understanding or or actually like is a culmination of my understanding of certain kinds of um, rhythmic or, res- or or resonances in in public space and and in my own body. And so, and what trap music did, I think for me was sort of like, wake me up to some changes in how I was understanding like my relationship to um, my, my, myself, right? I was like, oh, here's a music that does not really hold on to like the idea of freedom as its primary, as its primary like trajectory. It does not care <laughs> about that work. I don't think so. And so then if that's the case, and this is the most popular music in the world, 
and certainly the most popular black music in the world, then what is that? What, what are we supposed to say? Because I tell you what, as academics, we cannot afford to ignore that. And, um, and yet the complexity of the emotional platform makes us wish to ignore it, you know, <laughs> and, and like, you know, it's just too much. Like we can talk about abolition, but we cannot talk about how trap music operates in conversation with the project of jailing young black men. Well, why not? Why can't we at least undertake this as a problem that we might be in conversation with with the young people, right? And so that's what the class was for. Like the question of like rhythmic variation in the triplet and like how the hi-hat works, we could talk about that another day, but it does seem to me that like, so the way variation is, is like theorized by certain people like Deleuze and Guattari, right? Like, I've been trying to understand why the way the music impacts me um, makes me begin to think about or, or assists me in thinking about the um, unrecoverability of certain, uh, let's see, art practices that are trap music. I've been thinking about how Chief Keith operates as a kind of a figure that might be, you know, what I think of as kind of like a nomad warring figure, which is why the title of this essay is Warring. How these kinds of like, oh, I don't know. I have just I have more to say than I could possibly say here, but I do think that the hi-hat and that triplet kind of guides us in the direction of thinking about how um, that it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a, the sound of a, ch, a, ch, a ch, 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 ch. so it's like, um, that's what we're talking about. It's like how that sound may be the sound of a certain kind of unrecoverability or, um, you know, refusal to be incorporated that I've been thinking about. Oh gosh. Okay, so we're getting really close to time. So many more things. Um, maybe I'll I'll ask this as a closing a closing thing before um, we send it back to Lori to wrap up the event. Um, I asked if either of you had a writing prompt that you'd be willing to share with the audience. How about this? Either a writing prompt or a song recommendation. It feels sort of more in line with Ken's question. What should we be listening to? <laughs> Terrence has a great answer to this question. Well, I mean, I, you know, uh, for which part? For the music or for the prompt? I've been listening yeah. to Sun Ra lately. Who hasn't been listening to Sun Ra lately? Um, here's the one, though, you know, here's the prompt. Uh, something that I've been doing forever, and it's, it's just essentially like a Frank O'Hara thing, like uh, writing your day in one sentence. You know, you wake up and you start from there. I woke up, and then you just see how long you can let that sentence go until you get to bed. And then whatever's exciting, that's the point of the day, you know, whatever seemed like maybe it was a great lunch or maybe it was some terrible news or maybe it was just, I mean, it's something, every day has a point to it. That's what you just have to locate the point. Um, so that kind of exercise is one way to locate the point of your day. Just, so you got to do it at the end or, or the next morning, you know, what you ate, where you go, who you see, you won't remember everything, um, but it will be a lyrical sentence. It shouldn't be like a short sentence, obviously. So how about that? There's a problem. That's just like a... That's awesome. That's awesome. What a great parting parting gift. Simone, you want to give us a song, a song recommendation? Um, the song that is on repeat for me right now is a song called Lamb Truck, which is produced by Chief Keith. Um, and the primary performer is, is Tato, his cousin Tato. Um, and that I've just been listening to it constantly. I love that. I love that. Thank you both. Thank you both so much. Um, I'm going to turn things over to um, Lori to close us out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the Arts Research Center, we are so grateful to Simone White and Terrence Haynes for joining us tonight. 
being so generous uh, with their time and the honesty of their answers. Uh, and of course, uh, Tachayuma Elliott for stewarding, stewarding this remarkable conversation. Uh, there has been so much love in the chat. Uh, we'll save it and send it on, uh, but a couple notes include Simone White is my hero in all caps and Terrence, I bow in gratitude to your personal honesty and vulnerability. It helps me so much. I just want to make sure that you heard that. Um, many thanks to Engaging the Census Foundation and their support of Poetry in the Census, along with the Department of English, the Black Studies Collaboratory, and the Center for Race and Gender for their co-sponsorship of this event. Finally, please join us in April for our Flash Reading Series. You can find out more soon on our website, arts.berkeley.edu. Thanks, everyone, and have a great night. Thank <laughs> you.